I'm Dr. Candace Matthews. I'm the state chair for the Texas Coalition of Black Democrats, AKA the Texas Democratic Black Caucus. We are here uh, after the judgment for the case in regards to Daryl George and Ms. George, and we are highly disappointed on the decision that was made. Uh, Daryl will have to continue to be in in school suspension until the federal case kicks in, and that is what Attorney Booker is going to be working on getting an injunction done on that portion of it. So that's all that we know on that as far as dealing on that portion with next steps. But as I was walking with Miss George and Daryl, you know, you, you can feel the sense of anger, you can feel the sense of confusion, you can feel even with Daryl, Daryl made this statement and told me this straight up with tears in his eyes. All because of my hair, I can't get my education because of my hair. I cannot be around other peers and enjoy my junior year because of my hair. And in that process, you know, I told him, y'all gone and go, and I will relay the message. But they did want me to let you guys know, thank you so much for coming out and showing support and amplifying this issue. But they did state that they would not lay down. They are going to continue to fight and we are going to be on the battlefield with them. So I would like to bring up uh, State Rep. Ron Reynolds, who is the chair of the Texas Legislative Black Caucus. And also he was one of the witnesses that spoke on the stand and also the co-author co of the Crown Act. State Rep. Thank you, Dr. Matthews, and I'm proud to be standing here with two of my colleagues in the caucus, Representative Carl Sherman uh, out of Dallas, DeSoto, and also Representative Jelana Jones out of Houston. And it's, I'm struggling with words because I'm very, very disappointed with the outcome today. I came here today hoping and praying that the outcome would be different, that Daryl would be able to go back to school with his peers and learn in an environment that fostered uh, cohesive relationships and camaraderie with his peers. And we left today with sadness and disappointment. But like Dr. Matthew said, that we're not giving up and they're not giving up. Uh, they are rightfully disappointed and dejected. And we are very, very disappointed as well and I want to just tell you that we will not stop we will continue to speak truth to power we will based on what the judge said uh, we will file legislation as the joint author of this bill with representative Sherman that was supported by representative Jones we will file a new crown act that will include hair length because the school district is hell-bent on finding a loophole. They want to violate the spirit of the law. I articulated on the stand what the legislative intent behind it was. And unfortunately, the judge made a different ruling. Now, Attorney Booker will be able to appeal. And if she's unsuccessful, we will make sure that we file another bill because we know the purpose of the bill, the purpose of the legislation is to protect students like Daryl, protect students like DeAndre before him and Caden, the same students that Barbara's Hill has discriminated against because of their locks, their braids, and their twist. And we're sick and tired of the bad faith and the long history of discrimination from the school district. And I'm gonna leave with this. As a proud person of faith, there's a scripture in Proverbs 31, 8 and 9. It says, speak out for the one who cannot speak for the rights of those who are doomed. Speak out, judge fairly, and defend the rights of oppressed and needy people. We're going to speak out for the Daryls of the world. We're going to speak out for all the other African-American students that are similarly situated, that want to wear their natural hair, that want to go to school with their peers, that want to get an education and not be discriminated against because they want to wear their natural hairstyle. Barbara's here, we have a message for you. We're not going away. We live in a 
very racially inclusive environment in Texas. There are more African Americans in Texas than any other state. We're proud that we passed a bipartisan bill that Governor Abbott had a ceremonial bill signing. That's how significant House Bill 567 was. It was so significant that there was a bill signing ceremony for it. That's, that doesn't happen. My colleagues will tell you that only happens for really big bills that are bipartisan in nature. And that's what happened. And so we're disappointed, but we're not despaired. We will not quit. We will continue to stand with Daryl and his family, Dr. Matthews, and all of the stakeholders. And I appreciate my colleagues for traveling here today to make sure that our presence was felt. And this is not the last that you will hear from the Texas Legislative Black Caucus because I do know that we will be filing another bill so that Barbers Hill cannot skirt behind a loophole so that they can continue to discriminate against the students that they're there to educate and serve. State Rep. Jelana Jones. Good afternoon. My name is Jelana Jones. I'm the state representative for House District 147 in Houston. I'm heartbroken. Uh, the ruling was worse. When I accompanied Daryl and his mom to the car, I saw a child who was crying and he was confused and he was upset and he didn't understand. His mother was visibly shaking, like shaking. Uh, and so they're unable to be here because he thought he would eventually end up being in the classroom, not the courtroom. The thing that stood out to me the most, I'm a criminal defense lawyer in my day, I'm a, actually more than criminal defense, but I'm a lawyer in my day job, I'm a trial lawyer. The thing that stood out to me the most is, is why it's so important that the judiciary be diverse. The judge didn't understand. The lawyer for the ISD didn't understand that locks, dreadlocks, whatever it is you wanna call it, your hair has to be sufficiently long for it to lock. Your hair doesn't lock when it's short. It has to have weight to it. And so locks necessarily require that they be below your eyebrow as their uh, school policy requires. Just because when you decide, and oh, by the way, my child has locks. Actually, he's a grown man. My, my son has locks and I used to have locks. Your hair doesn't lock, you have to keep going to get your hair done and twist it and it'll come loose until it grows out long enough that it can lock and be weighted down. So when the district's lawyer says something about, oh, we've all traveled around the world and we've seen this short, cultural competence matters. Mm -hmm. No, before it gets long, it's gotta be short. It's not a lock. You pay a lot of money to make it lock. I'll also tell you something else about black hair. Some people can't grow their hair long naturally, like where it just different people have different textures of hair. But some people want long hair. And one of the ways that we as black people are able to grow our hair long, like maybe some of our European counterparts have, is that we lock our hair or we braid our hair. That's the whole point. And I think that, again, your hairstyle doesn't determine whether you can learn or not. That's right. But the whole point, his hair was pulled back. Right. His hair was above his eyebrows. So it's not about that. That's right. Right? Otherwise, they would have made an exception for it. But trust and believe that we will continue to fight in court. We will continue to show up. I will continue to show up because that baby, and he's a baby, should not have been in the courtroom, he should have been in the classroom. That's right. Mm -hmm. But we, I'm gonna make sure I run to Representative Retta Bowers, because it's her bill, and we will make sure that we explain how locks grow for those of you who are culturally incompetent and who don't understand what locks are and how they work. 
So that policy is oxymoronic. It's contradictory to locks. Um, again, I think we've got to remember that this is about Daryl. And to see that young man crying. He didn't understand. We couldn't explain it to him. We tried to explain it to him. He just wants to learn. And he just wants to be normal. His mom was so physically shaken. Like I was worried about her. Are you okay? Do I need to get you some water? Please pray for this family because they need it. This is gonna be a teachable moment. One day, I mean, this, this ruling today does nothing but motivate me. It reminds me why I need to be in the legislature because unlike the legislature that is overwhelmingly white, Texas is not, Texas is diverse. And sometimes you just don't have the perspective to be able to do right by all the constituents that you represent. Again, my name is Jolanda Jones, spelled J-O-L-A-N-D-A, -A, last name Jones. I'm a state representative for House District 147, and I'm just heartbroken. Okay. State Rep. Carl Sherman. Thank you, Chairwoman Matthews. Uh, to my colleagues, to Representative Bowers, uh, today, as we are here, this is really a sad commentary about where we are as a state in the year of our Lord and Savior, 2024, that we would be here continuing to fight against hair discrimination. We passed an important piece of legislation, the Crown Act, HB 567. And this, this school district, the Barbers Hills School District, has a history of opposing the laws that we have passed. That's right. And so today, I, as a representative of the Texas House, I see more the importance of why I'm running for the U.S. Senate. Because for those of you who say, I don't do politics, politics does you all day, every day. Mm. When a young man cannot learn in class because he chooses to wear his natural hair, mm. a part of our heritage, that's right. then that's politics. That's right. yeah. I'm mm -hmm. sick and tired of folks who want to criminalize our way of life, that's right. to criminalize our hair. To the five million students in the public school systems of Texas, we apologize to you because this shouldn't be. And I just know that we have a brighter future with you leaving behind the legacy of a long history of discriminating against African Americans for their natural hair. This must end, it must stop, and we will continue the fight until justice is for all. God bless you again, I'm Carl Sherman, Texas State Representative, District 109 out of the Dallas area. Thank you. Also, we're gonna bring up our attorney. This is our, the people's attorney. Yeah. And I'm saying it again, the people's attorney. Yeah. Because she swung them gloves of justice and she's not done. Okay, she could take a little hit right now, it's okay. Because again, we got her back, we got the George families back, and we're not going nowhere. Attorney Booker. Yeah. Come on, let's give a yeah. hand. Woo. Cases like this are exactly what appeals are for. Oh. There are times when judges miss and judicial review is, is not spot on or even on. The problem today is that he failed to look at the fact that constitutional implications are amongst us when you have a statute that talks about race. Yes. Yeah. You cannot avoid it. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Period. 
And whenever you raise the Constitution, everything goes on a balancing test. That's with the federal government, which they know that better. Because I would offer up to all of you to go look at the Arnold case and to see how the court has already made a finding. And that's the same school that we're up against right now with the same grooming and dress code. And the mm. federal government looked at it real quick and said, mm, looks like it's gonna be racial discrimination and gender discrimination. Yeah. Why? Because they're the federal government and they definitely understand the Constitution. For whatever reason, with all due respect to Judge Kane, he doesn't get the, the United States Constitution, which is why I ran the United States claim to him, right? Mm. Because at the end of the day, not true. Something is not facially neutral if it specifies between girls or boys. That's so right. you tell me how something's, gen how something's neutral. If it specifies and says girls this, boys that, it's not neutral. It's not neutral. And I would argue that it's only racially neutral on its face. Because if you look at who it disproportionately affects, it's gonna yes. be blacks. Yes. And the United States Constitution guards against that. Doesn't matter what your intent is. If in the end, you're only affecting a small class, it's discriminatory. So whether or not, so the judge is hiding behind the fact that well, not before the, it's not before the court as to whether or not this is unconstitutional. The only question in front of the court is whether or not they're violating the Crown Act. Oh, but when you come to judicial interpretation, you cannot make a law that goes against other well-settled law. Mm. You cannot, and in, 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 in Texas government code, 311.021 talks about the legislature and what they intend when they enact a law. Compliant, the first number one is, this is the state code 311.021. First thing a judge is to understand is that compliance with the constitutions of this state and the United States is intended. So how you can try to take their law and say that it's unconstitutional on the federal level doesn't make sense to me. You can't construct it or interpret it in a way that it goes against federal law. That's right. And it behooves me how no balancing test at all was done when we clearly know we're touching on constitutional concerns. Yes. And then they say that it's no class, but it clearly is. So when you have a class, you have a protection, Constitution kicks in. Where was the Constitution? The Constitution wasn't here today. Mm. The only thing he looked at was the Crown Act. And with all due respect to the legislators, number one, I thought this would happen. Because I'm sorry, and I'm not trying to disrespect anybody, but I'm from Texas. Yeah. I know how it is. This is Barbers Hill. I grew up in Cypher. I'm not too far removed. I grew up with this thought process, mm. which is why I sat there and I preserved error for appeal. And I talked about that balancing test that he didn't consider. I talked about the constitutional implications of the statute, which he didn't consider. That's right. And he must consider that. And at the end of the day, yes, I filed a federal constitution to the Crown Act, which many of you don't know. Why did I file it? So that when he does this right here, good, now the record's made. Because mm. I'm already in federal court and I'm already saying this Crown Act is unconstitutional on its face and it's because people are able to use it in a discriminatory manner. Not because they wrote it wrong, but guess what? You can get it voided out either way. And if somebody's able to use a law to discriminate against a certain class, which we already know who's being discriminated against because the only people that are being affected are black males at Barbers Hill, then we're done. It's not a good law. And this shows us that it's the interpretation of the law. This is how we see how big the judiciary is. A lot of people don't understand why people fight over Supreme Court justices. This is why. Because right. they interpret, right? We're moving for a federal injunction. We have the case open. I've already done what I need to do to request it. I was giving this court deference. You know, I didn't want to be rude and immediately ask for that federal injunction when we had a trial date that was so near. Plus, trying to run a case on top of a case, no. But we're going to continue to fight.
and we're confident that we will get the injunction and then you all will see in the end the issue with this law and it 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 it, it hurts that we have to get to the end but guess what you know brown versus board of education i mean it's so many and i hate to say it and i'm not you know racist in any way god knows i'm not but it it, it, it we always we, we're black we always got to get to the end okay we're used to it I, am I worried about it? No. My mom asked me, she said, Allie, you gonna win this case? I said, I should. That was my response, I should. Because I already know what time it is. I know where I'm at, but I don't care. Because that's the reason that we have appeals. Because they don't get it right. We'll be back here. Over my body, we'll be back here. And he's gonna try it right when he tries it the second time. Cause they really don't need to change it. To be honest, they don't need to change it. It's his, it's his interpretation of it and Barbara's Hill interpretation of it that, that is rendering it unconstitutional, which I knew, which is why I set it up. I didn't move to strike the Crown Act because on its face, I believe it's wrong. I put in that paper that I'm moving to strike the Crown Act because bad people are using a good law in a bad way. And that's what's happening. And when you have a judge that sits up here and God, I'm so sorry to say this, but reads a remand and says the remand told him what he was supposed to do God of mercy, that is not the way it works, sir. A remand tells you what you are supposed to do if the remand is coming from the appellate court. This was the federal court. So what they were saying was whether or not the Crown Act and Barbara's Hill ISD dress code violates the Crown Act is not a federal question. It isn't. It's a state Crown Act. And I'm not trying to sound cocky, egotistical, but then I side with Jolanda and I say, well, when you're trying cases, it's different because you look at it from another way, right? Because we were remanded here because that was a state action on a state law case, not because constitution doesn't matter or not because the constitution isn't implicated. And it's crazy when you have, and God forgive me, an already made, ready made, you know, order and ruling. When today we had additional evidence presented. That's just all I'm gonna say on that. I don't think he gave any weight to the testimony on today, right? Because he would have had the exhibits prior to, but should he have been looking at these exhibits and how do you have something already written? You don't take it under advisement, you're ready to go. But you don't discuss the balancing test, the constitution or anything along those lines. So the next step is federal. We'll be moving for an injunction, so watch us. We'll be moving for an appeal here because we believe that the case when the appellate courts look at it, they're gonna remand it back for him to do the proper test to determine whether or not constitutional implications rise in this case. But it's a case of first precedence, so that's what happens sometimes, you know? Uh, sometimes that happens. You'd like to think that there are laws to cover everything, but there's not always laws to cover everything. And that's just simply how it goes. And so when you have a law and you have to create it to cover something, you're going to have your bumps along the road. But we're going to get there. We'll show, tell, and prove. I mean, I, I assume he did. I mean, I can only go off of what I saw. It was ready to go. It was a speech. Do you, how did you take it when he essentially invited your client to lobby the state legislature to insert language in the law and then go to the school board? I was so happy he said it on the record so that I can use it for appellate purposes. 
that's what I thought. I was like, please keep talking. That's exactly what I thought. Because you're giving them an understanding of what you are and what you're not looking at, right? So, I mean, I, essentially, he sided with an argument of the absence of language is why that they were in compliance with the law. Is that, am I reading that right? Uh, yes, but he's wrong because the absence of language isn't the only thing that you look at, right? Legislative intent is so many things, and that's what throws me as well. Because when you're looking at legislative intent and you're looking at the intent and purpose behind the law, because we really only had two small legislative intent blurbs to look at, okay, when you, when you all go through the evidence, it's only two. And so it's ambiguous on its face. And so what he should have done was look at the history of the subject matter involved, the end to be obtained, the mischief to be remedied, and the purpose to be accomplished. What, what were they trying to accomplish? He didn't take that into consideration at all. He didn't allow, he didn't open up. He only went on the plain meaning of the law, but here it's ambiguous, so you have to go further and include extrinsic evidence, which he didn't do. And so, it even tells you if the strict letter is going to lead to injustice, absurdity, or contradictory provisions. That's why I argue that it contradicts the United States Constitution. The duty devolves upon the court of ascertaining the true meaning, which the court is telling you because they're not going to, no legislature is going to make a law that they intend to go against the United States law, which would be here be the um, Equal Protection Act, ECA or the Equal Protection Clause underneath the United States Constitution, right? They say if the intentions of the legislature cannot be discovered, it's the duty of the court to give the statute a reasonable construction. That's also where he failed, consistent with general principles of law. Uh, this is my language, not yours, but was this a bad faith interpretation of a law meant to be an affirmative defense of the protected class? God forgive me, I don't think he understands how to move on in the balancing test. So he, in my opinion, he doesn't even consider it. He just looked at the law and said, this is what I want to believe that it means. It, it, he didn't use the law and map through, go through everything he was supposed to go through. Long story short, I don't think he, so he didn't, he missed all of that, uh, if that makes sense. I mean, he didn't even, you know, and, and, and he might, I mean, I don't want to say this, but he, I mean, it may have been something where, you know, it's going to have to be an appellate. Sometimes we know that. <laughs> I wanted to ask Representative Reynolds, can you on the stand? I know the judge asked you directly, you know, whether there was exact language about length in the law. You said no, but you were trying to, I think, explain what the intent was behind the law, the, the purpose. Do you feel like maybe the judge didn't take what you were trying to say, explain fully in, in making a decision that he didn't no. really sort of listen to what you were trying to explain? I, I think I was very clear. I think the judge wanted to come with an outcome that favored the local school district. I believe that I made it very clear of what the legislative intent was. And so the judge was not given any kind of deference to what the legislative intent was. The intent was to protect students like Daryl, was to protect students like DeAndre, was to protect students like Caden that Barbara's Hill had discriminated against. That's why we filed the law, I said that. So if we filed the law to protect those students to wear those hairstyles, then it's very clear. It was very clear what the intent was. So this was a loophole, what law you call a pretext. They tried to find a red herring. It's in bad faith. It's in bad faith, and the, the, the result of it is hurt students like Daryl, hurt students like DeAndre, and many others who have probably conformed to European standards because they wanted to stay at the school. Thank God for people like Daryl. Yeah. Thank God for people yeah. like DeAndre yeah. that are willing to stand up and be on the right side of yeah. history. Yeah. The, the school district, I don't believe Ali's right. History is not going to judge Barbara's Hill you know, they, they may have won the battle, but they won't win the war. They yeah, will not. Okay? And so I think the judge gave them deference to get a outcome that favored what they wanted to do with their dress, with their policy. But clearly, it, it wasn't the legislative intent. There is no, I mean, Retta has said that. 
we've all said that. We've all, we all had affidavits, sworn testimony. So there's no contradiction. They didn't have any legislators say, no, that's not what the Crown Act is for. They know damn well what it was for. And they know it was, it was to protect Daryl. And it went into effect and they didn't give a damn. And I'm just being very candid because I'm, 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 I'm frustrated that they want to hide behind some loophole. That's bad. That's what you call bad faith. When you want to, when you don't want to comply with the law, you try to find whatever kind of loophole. That's what they did. And that's why we have to continue to fight on. Yes. Do we have any other questions? Question. So if, if you were to go back and change the language in the law to, to, to address this, would, for this student, would that make a difference? I mean, or does, does there need to be a legal remedy in court for his future and his record in school? Do you see what I'm getting at? Does it matter? Well, I'll, I'll let the attorney answer the legal question. I'll tell you the legislative question. This isn't. This this will help future students, right? We only meet once every two years unless Governor Abbott calls a special session. He only calls special sessions for vouchers. He's not calling one for the Crown Act. So we have to wait until 2025. And then to file the bill, and then the bill at, a, at the earliest wouldn't go into effect until September of that next year. I mean, come on. So this is going to help future students, but an immediate remedy has to come from the court. And that's why we are very grateful for attorneys like Attorney Booker for taking this to the courts so that we can get immediate relief, so that Daryl can go back to, again, this is a human being. We, we give we give dogs more protection than we're giving him yes. right and I, and this 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 person just wants to go and learn he just wants to be with his peers he's isolated he's treated like a criminal mm -hmm. he's he's treated like he's in you know isolation like he committed some heinous crime that's what it, that's what's happening to him his self-esteem his mental health his stress is 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 is, is really he, he left here so dejected okay. and, and our hearts are heavy right now I mean, we're, we, we do have tears because it's, it's not right. I, I want to say something. The thing that I thought was really, as a trial lawyer myself, the whole issue in this case was legislative intent. The Barbara Shill ISD lawyer came out the bat in her opening statement saying we shouldn't listen to the people who voted on it because it doesn't matter, but instead we know what they meant. That's disrespectful. Um, to what uh, Attorney Booker said, I'm a trial lawyer. I'm choosing my words carefully right here. <laughs> After the arguments, he immediately went into his ruling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that again. After his arguments, he immediately ruled, which means he didn't take into consideration the closing arguments. Sometimes cases are long, they're complicated. People say stuff, you don't remember exactly what they said. So closing arguments is to help the court remember what happened, who said it, and everything. Attorney Booker gave a very thorough, lengthy um, closing argument and pointed out point by point all the stuff that he was supposed to consider in the law. And like, he, he I thought, if I were him, if I were a judge, I'd at least put the court in recess, went to the back and pretended like I considered some stuff Ooh. and come back. I would have done that, mm. right? Because the optics, it looked like the fix was in. Yep. Yep. And when people come into court, they want to feel like they have a fair shot, That's right. right? That the trial fact is going to be fair. I will also tell you that when we get sworn in as state representatives, we're, we pass laws that comply with the state of Texas and the United States Constitution. So you don't get to edge out the United States Constitution just because we're, where are we? Chambers County. Yeah, in Chambers County, Anahuac, An 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 mm. right? You don't get to cut that out, carve that out. And so it's really sad to me. Um, and, I, and I believe just looking and listening Every argument that Barbara's Hill ISD made, the judge for the most part signed off on. So it was for people who have been historically disenfranchised and we've had to fight in court for everything that 
that other citizens that this country values to walk into court and just basically see like a almost like a kangaroo system mm -hmm. like that's mm -hmm. that it, that's just that's what it was like and I thought it was extremely patronizing from the judge at the bench in a row with all the power to <laughs> what he did to DeAndre oh son you know I hope one day to be able to vote for you and yeah. you know did, uh, whatever yeah. he called it I mean did he call him by his first name and I don't think so. But my point is, he patronized the child. That's right. Mm. You know, um, it was sad to watch, but I think that it's made we in the legislature more resolved That's right. That's right. to do the right thing. You can't anticipate what loopholes people are going to try to create, but at a minimum, we can we can fix the length loophole. Although. Yeah. Mm locks are intended. I mean, look at, there are people here with locks and braids. Look at them. Yeah. They're long. Yeah. They're long. Mm -hmm. And girls have long hair, right? So, yeah, I, I mean, they, they, they are, and let me say this. I traveled here today. I was supposed to be a witness in this trial. The judge did not want the legislators who actually voted on it, and we knew the legislative intent to testify which is why I did not testify. Because mm. the compromise was they would let one person testify. Well, they kept evidence out. That's right. Oh. They did. They kept evidence out. Um, they disrespected legislators mm -hmm. who drove here to share why we did what we did. And I don't believe the Crown Act is bad. I believe the Crown Act is good because it was filed to protect kids who were being discriminated against in Barbers Hill ISD. The fact that the judge in Barbers Hill misinterpreted it, and I'm not going to even say they have a bad intent. You know, I'm going to say they don't have any cultural competence. And that's why they didn't understand it. Thank you. you was there an attempt to, to subpoena Superintendent Bull to testify today? And if, if there was, why wasn't he open? There are reasons why he was subpoenaed. There are reasons why he did not testify today. Um, sometimes you have to give and take. And that's essentially what we did in allowing him not to testify. Because the only, ex the only thing we would have honestly needed him for was to state the goals, yeah. right? But we got that in, in and through his Chronicle ad, in and through the grooming address policy, and in and through his affidavits. And given the circumstances, we felt like that was the best move because all he can really talk about is his policy as it relates. And the judge had it. The judge just did not consider things. That's all. And, you know, to answer the question as to what can be done for this student, well, that's why I filed the constitutional challenge to the law, was to make sure that he's protected. Because now we're going on the federal level, and the federal, the federal government is going to look at this law. And they're going to look at it not what's said about it, but they're going to look at the impact it has. And that's going to be an issue, is the impact that the law is having. And the court is going to have to try to alter it or either void out part of it or vo void it out in full. And I assume they'll just kick it completely out because you can't really alter the act to add language. You can't strike through to add. Um, and then that will give us the gateway that we need in order to challenge the educational records. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. They knew we were going to come for TEA. TEA, Mike Morath, they don't want to be sued. All I was waiting for was for our grievance process to be extended. And then we were going to appeal to TEA and try to make them make a decision, right? So what do you do? You rush this case to trial and let the judge make a decision so TEA in the state of Texas is safe right 
in light of the law. And so, I mean, I honestly believe that that's why this was done. Because they know, okay, we come up on appeal, it'll take time, right? And meanwhile, we wouldn't be able to pull the state of Texas into the federal lawsuit that's still pending. So, I mean, everything is strategic. But again, we'll be victorious in the end. I'm not concerned about that. And on the federal level, mm -hmm. and eventually here, eventually here. Mm -hmm. So, do we have any other questions? Because I have a closing statement. Can I make one question? Yes. Are you the media? Uh, yeah. I'm okay. Just the the oh, okay. Go ahead. Um, how long he's been in in school suspension, and with today's ruling, does that mean that he will stay in? in school yes, suspension? he's going to he's going to stay in in school suspension because they had him in in school suspension. They started off in, on August thirty first, then from there matriculated to DAEP, then from DAEP, then right after right before Thanksgiving. They end up taking him out of the AEP and putting him back in ISS. So when he goes back to school tomorrow, he will have to go back into ISS until Attorney Booker get her pleadings on what she's going to do with the federal injunction. So that's why we were saying that the fight is not over. But what I find interesting, and I'm going to be honest with you, Attorney Booker, I really do believe that the fix was already in from the job. It was already in. Because at the end of the day, y'all got to keep in mind where we at. Yeah. Right. Okay? Right. And I'm going to end it with this. Welcome oh. to Chambers County. Oh. That's why we got to have federal intervention. Or otherwise, our children are going to continue to be pressed upon by people that wear these kind of hats and that are embedded in our educational system as educational assassins. So I say that to say this, I'm going to say what people scared to say. We know who you are. This is a one size fit all. I hope you're proud of yourself today. But just know the fight is going to continue and we're going to unleash every last one of your hats. Are there any other questions? Because this press conference is over. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. Justice for Sarah George. Justice for Sarah George. Justice for Sarah George. Justice for Sarah George.